On a cold night in February 1973, a caravan rolled through the Pine Ridge Reservation in South Dakota. The cars were packed with 200 Indians, men and women, local Oglala Lakota, and members of the urban militant group, the American Indian Movement. They headed toward the hallowed ground of Wounded Knee, the site of the last massacre of the Indian Wars. Going into Wounded Knee that night, when it was dark and, and scary, and we were clinging to our weapons tightly. It was a full moon and we knew that a battle was gonna come. I was sitting there thinking of some of these young men that are around me, am I committing them to, to die? I was ready to do whatever it takes for change. I didn't care. I had children, and for them, I figured I could make a stand here. They were up to no good. I mean, why would they be traveling in a caravan with all these weapons and all these Molotov cocktails if they weren't going to engage in some kind of destructive activity? By the 1970s, native people, once masters of the continent, had become invisible, consigned to the margins of American life. Their anger and frustration would explode in Wounded Knee. We were about to be obliterated culturally. Our, our spiritual way of life, our entire way of life was about to be stamped out. And this was a rebirth of our dignity and self-pride. For the next 71 days, Indian protesters at Wounded Knee would hold off the federal government at gunpoint. Media from around the world would give the siege day-by-day -day coverage, and Native Americans from across the nation would come to Wounded Knee to be part of what they hoped would be a new beginning. The message that went out is that a band of Indians could take on this government. Tecumseh had his day, Geronimo, Sitting Bull, Crazy Horse, we had ours. We have tonight one of the strangest stories to come along in a long time. A group of American Indians has taken over the town of Wounded Knee in South Dakota, and they have been holding it for nearly a whole day. This afternoon, the FBI said the Indians are in charge of the town. We had just finished eating our dinner, and um, so I looked out the window, and I said, well, for heaven's sake, who opened the store? And they're carrying things out, bringing things out by the carload. And I was floored, just floored. After stripping bare the Wounded Knee Trading Post, the village's only store, the protesters took over a local church holding the minister and other white residents hostage. They quickly blocked all roads leading into town. On Tuesday, February 27th, I received a telephone call from some news outlet. I was told that the caravan forcibly took over the village, were holding hostages and causing destruction there. So I immediately got my agents together, and I proceeded to the main entrance to Wounded Knee. We saw a third car coming, and then it, then it was, uh, it kind of came, uh, drove just right up, kind of, not too far off. So when they come on, they got out of the car, they went looking around, and, and as soon as they put the glasses up, we, we opened up on them. We didn't know where we were here, and uh, that's far enough. I called inside Wounded B, and I said, look, let's, let's get together and have a meeting so we can stop uh, the potential for bloodshed here. Let's talk about this. As I walked up to them, I see all these rifles pointed at me, and it uh, gives you an uneasy feeling. That's Joseph Trimbach with the FBI. Yeah, Trimbach came to that roadblock, and you could tell he'd been up all night. And he's very irritable. And we have law enforcement back here that's armed, and we have hostages here. 
I have no idea what's going to happen next. They came out and gave me this list of demands. The protesters called for a federal investigation of corruption on reservations in South Dakota and immediate Senate hearings on broken treaties with Indian nations. The headquarters of the Sufi... We're angry about losing our land, losing our language, being uh, uh, ripped off of, of uh, our ability to live as Indian people. Our parents was telling us, you have to walk the white man road. Indian ways are going to be gone. Be a Christian. You know, uh, go to school and learn that English, but don't learn your own language. We wanted to give our lives in such a way that would have bring attention to, to what was happening in Indian country. And we were pretty sure that we were going to have to give our lives. The protesters demanded one change close to home. Through a translator, the Lakota chief Fool's Crow called for the immediate ouster of Dick Wilson, the elected head of the tribal government there on Pine Ridge. Wilson molested the Indians sometimes threatening them and so forth. Before the sun said, we want him out of office and there will be no trouble. My initial reaction was, this is something way beyond my pay grade, that someone in Washington is going to have to handle this. <laughs> the standoff was unfolding on the Pine Ridge Reservation home to the Oglala Lakota, not far from where chiefs like Red Cloud, Sitting Bull, and Crazy Horse had once led their people into battle. The Lakota, who Americans call the Sioux, are iconic in American history and the American imagination. These are buffalo hunters who lived in teepees who were at the battle with, uh, with General Custer. Nearly everything about the Lakota life is firmly implanted in the way that Americans think about Indians. By 1973, the Lakota way of life on the plains was largely in the past. The Oglala Sioux tribal government ran things on Pine Ridge and where traditional chiefs had once sought consensus, elected chairman Dick Wilson ruled with an iron hand. He was like a Chicago ward boss from the 1930s. Big flower sack of a guy, wore dark glasses inside and out, was fond of drinking, and uh, brought all his friends and family and cronies into office with him, effect, gave him jobs on the federal payroll on the Pine Ridge Reservation, as with most reservations, the tribal chairman and the council have a great deal of power to spread money around, to spread food around, or to withhold it, or to favor one part of the reservation over another, which is what was happening. Wilson favored mixed race, assimilated Indians like himself, and slighted the traditional Sioux who spoke their language practiced their religion, and remained loyal to the traditional Oglala chiefs. Do you get any help from, uh, from, from the tribal council? No. Dickie Wilson is the president here. He's the worst one, I think. <laughs> he's the, I don't know, he gets the most favorite thing. The federal census, I think every decade through the mid to end of the 20th century show Pine Ridge as the poorest jurisdiction in the United States. So there's poverty and then there's reservation poverty. When traditional Oglalas challenged corruption in tribal government, Dick Wilson responded with force. He had his own army which intimidated uh, the full bloods mostly, the traditional people. His goons started beating up the people, and no charges were ever pressed. And if they did, they got thrown out of court. He, he controlled the whole reservation. Some of the officers hated to arrest any of Dick's people, in spite of the fact that they did break the law. 
he helped me a number of times. So I felt that I owed him a loyalty. And, um, and so I didn't support everything he did, but irregardless of what he did, I still felt that loyalty. Well, there's been a lot of accusations made here lately, and uh, one in particular that upsets me is the fact that I am using a goon squad, so to speak. They are respectable and honest citizens of Pine Ridge. And we're all sharpshooters. Come to goon squad. Let's go again. <laughs> in late 1972, traditional Oglalas came together to push for Wilson's removal. They started a civil rights commission, Oglala Sioux Civil Rights Commission. And from there, they got the documentation of the corruption, of the misuse of funds. They got the evidence. And eventually the civil rights, they had a stack about an inch and a half thick or of all the testimony and violations, civil rights violations. Nobody ever got charged. Prompted by the dissidents, the Tribal Council held impeachment hearings in February 1973. But Wilson intimidated witnesses, strong-armed council members, and managed to survive. Many Oglalas felt they had one last desperate option. We've always been uh, peaceful and um, pretty much mind our own business, and making our living and raising our family law-abiding. Well, I believe that the time has come that we have to commit violence in order to be heard. Now, I don't want to see anybody killed. Okay? The time is going to come when the violence might have to be committed in order to wake the people up.